Good evening, everyone, and welcome. As the old proverb goes, to err is human. And what that means is that mistakes are quite normal and, in fact, to be expected. What I want to do tonight, as Mark's already touched on, is encourage some awareness and some thinking about human factors, with the idea being that you can make your diving safer and that of your team safer as well. As Mark's mentioned, uh, there's a bit of a, a thought process along the lines of human factors in diving being more relevant to technical diving than recreational diving. And I just don't agree. Regardless of how much equipment you're using, yes, technical diving is probably more complicated, but it's still the human in the loop, which is the, the source of the error these days. So a bit about um, my background, just so you can know where I'm coming from. I've just finished 20 years of RAF service. I've now emigrated to Australia. Uh, within that, I've got almost 3,000 flying hours, most of which have been on um, frontline fast jets. I'm a qualified flying instructor, uh, and I'm also the holder of a commercial pilot's license. So what that means is that I've been doing human factors for a long time. Pretty much all my adult career has been heavily involved in human factors. As far as diving is concerned, I'm a BSAC dive leader. I'm a military diving supervisor, and I'm also CCR qualified, but I will caveat that I'm still definitely a CCR novice. Comparing the two worlds of diving and flying, diving definitely has, has a lot to learn from, uh, from flying. We're a long way behind, and I think it's quite important that diving does what, it's, does what it can to, uh, to follow aviation's example. Something I'll emphasize as well is that I do not have all the answers. Regardless of um, my experience in anything I do, I'm, I'm definitely always learning about flying, I'm always learning about diving, and I'm still always learning about human factors. Some of you will have seen this picture from the Facebook advert, and these individual images all have something in common. They all depict situations where people died and human factors played a contributory role to a greater or lesser extent. And we'll come on to each of them as we go and see what lessons we can learn. So the scope for the rest of the presentation, I'll look at a human factors introduction, talk about a, a definition and why it's becoming more and more common and more and more organisations introduce it into their, their teaching of their employees. <clears throat> human factors in real life, it's really useful to look at how human factors have played a part in other people's experiences so that you can learn from them and move on. So I'll look at the case studies I've just talked about on the previous slide and also throw in a few stories from diving to give some real, some real diving context. The good news is there's plenty you can do about human factors in diving, so I will talk about that. I'll talk about some of the models that exist to help you get your head around it, and I'll also give you some techniques and thoughts to actually to mitigate against human factors in diving. I'll finish with three big takeaways to sum up, and then as Mark said, I'll take some questions at the end. Human factors is about making it easier to do the right thing and by default making it harder to do the wrong thing. There's lots of other science-y type definitions out there, but I really like this one. It's simple, it's to the point, and it, I think it just hits the, uh, hits the nail on the head quite simply. The right thing doesn't mean the morally right thing, it's talking about the correct thing, the correct process, and easier means more efficient, safer, and ultimately more rewarding. So why should I care? Why do I think you should care about human factors in diving? Let's just look at the history to start with. So human factors awareness training dates back to World War II when machines started to become more and more complicated, outpace um, humans and, and, get, and get a lot harder to, to use. And it's nowadays become mandatory. Uh, human factors awareness training is in various sectors. Mark's already mentioned most of them, I think, uh, aviation, the military, nuclear energy, medicine, offshore oil and gas, the mining industry, and this list gets longer all the time. And the reason is that the training has been shown to improve efficiency and productivity, and that appeals to the commercial side of any organization. Everybody can get better value for money out of it, but also safety for the people on the shop floor. This graph shows that over the 117 years of manned aviation, the prime cause of accidents has gone from being almost entirely machine causes being almost entirely human causes. Modern airplanes are just so reliable uh, with so much redundancy built in that the common factor is the human in the whether it's the pilot or air traffic control or the engineer. Now I think diving is quite similar because diving is an environment where humans aren't designed to, to, li to live. You cannot breathe underwater. You have to have equipment to support you. And so again, 
modern diving equipment is very reliable. The main source of failure is the, the human uh, in the loop. And I think it behoves diving to follow aviation's example. This, was... this graph just shows how successful the training has been. So from the late 1970s, when human factors awareness training became quite prevalent in commercial aviation, right the way through to 2017, the accident rate dropped by a factor of 17, which is a huge number really. And while technology has improved in that time to a certain extent, uh, human factors awareness training has played a massive part to improve safety. Uh, now let's look at some real life incidents and how they relate to diving such so we can learn from them. So the first one, the Costa Concordia in 2012, the ship sank after hitting rocks off the coast of Italy. Now the captain was sailing the ship much closer to the shore than the approved route. He turned all the alarms off for the navigation computers. He was navigating by sight at night, which is pretty difficult to do. But the interesting thing is that he'd done it at least three to four times before and kept on getting away with it. He was continually chipping away at the margin of error uh, until eventually uh, it, it went wrong. He hit the rocks and obviously we know what happened. The fact that he was going outside the safety boundaries but getting away with it and just continually getting away with it meant it felt normal, start, felt safe. And this is what's known as the normalization of deviation. It was also um, an interesting point in the investigation that thought he might have been showing off to a young lady. And it's safe to say that a, a contributory factor to accidents will definitely be um, showing off because that will certainly encourage risk taking. So how does this relate to diving? Pushing the rules. There's a gray area between pushing the rules and pushing the boundaries. Now pushing the boundaries is arguably to be encouraged. But it's important that you push the boundaries uh, within the rules and at your own pace, just to you ins ensure that you consolidate as you go. And um, don't, don't get yourself out of your comfort zone too quickly. Pushing the rules is something quite different. An example would be going deeper than your max certified depth by two, five, ten meters. You do it once, you get away with it, you do it again. And all of a sudden it becomes the norm to go deeper than the max depth to which you're certified. But eventually it may well catch you out. You don't know what you don't know and you're unaware of the consequences and it may well be, uh, be too late before, before you realize. Excuse me, cutting corners. So an example of this would be cutting down on or missing decompression stops. Now that's unlikely to happen, I think with a computer, they're relatively black and white. But if you use tables for some reason, then you're using dive tables. We know they're very conservative. You could be sat at six meters, getting quite bored and you think, do you know what, I'll just shave a couple of minutes off. I wasn't at the max depth for the whole time. I know the tables are rounded up. So you surface early and then you do that again and you get away with it. You don't get decompression sickness, but eventually you just chip away at those margins until eventually you fall foul and get DCS. Another example of cutting corners would be pre-dive check. So when we do our training, when we're, in, when we're qualified, newly qualified after training, we will religiously do our pre-dive checks with a buddy because that's what we've been taught to do. But over time, you'll get used to doing, the, doing your training, uh, sorry, doing your checks by yourself without worrying about um, having a buddy look over you because you think, oh, it's fine, I, I can do this. And because very rarely things do go wrong, things do get missed, then it's fine. But there's a good chance that you will start missing things. You don't know you're missing them because nobody's monitoring your checks. And all of a sudden that process has become normal, but exposes you to greater risk. When my girlfriend first saw this picture, she thought it was some crazy deep sea jellyfish, but it is in fact the uh, Challenger space shuttle that exploded in 1986. Now, the cause of the failure was identified as just a simple O-ring that failed. It was really cold launch conditions on the day, but the O-ring was known to be a poor design. It had been reported as early as 1977, but it wasn't really fit for purpose. And it had in fact almost failed before, Several previous launches had shown sign uh, that the O-ring had, had almost had partially failed. But nobody really did anything. Nobody really spoke up um, within NASA loud enough to actually get the design changed. And this is an example of what's called groupthink. The individual members of a team become overly concerned with conforming with the rest of the team such that it results in irrational or dysfunctional outcomes. The desire to be cohesive comes at all costs. and Critical evaluation becomes impossible as those involved are desperate to avoid conflict. Now within NASA, people knew, but nobody said anything as they thought they'd be the only one to put their hands up. They thought everybody else thought it was fine. 
Nobody wanted to be that guy to upset the mission in the team. Nobody wanted to risk conflict. And as a result, seven astronauts died. Within diving, a few examples. First one I'll go into is nitrox. So when nitrox first came in, uh, it was initially treated as the devil's gas. You couldn't touch it. It wasn't, it wasn't taught. Then gradually it was introduced into diving, albeit it's a relatively advanced concept. But nowadays, nitrox is introduced very early. The interesting thing is the science has never really changed. It's always been the science to do with nitrox. But once upon a time, a few people decided it wasn't very good. So everyone jumped on the bandwagon, the bandwagon. And nowadays, everyone thinks it's great. So everyone jumps on the bandwagon. That The entire organization thinks the same thing because nobody wants to be the odd one out. Let's say a club diving officer comes up with a really ambitious dive plan. There may well be people in the group that just sort of think, oh, I'm just not really sure about this. But they look around and nobody else is putting their hands up. So they think, oh, everybody else thinks it's fine. Yeah, we'll go along with it. But actually, there may well be quite a few people in the group that aren't so key. Uh, but because nobody puts their hand up, everybody goes along with it. Group think. This depicts an accident in 2015 when a car hit a motorbike, killed the motorcyclist, and eventually the car driver admitted to using her phone while driving. The brain only has so much space, and using your phone, it's just math, really. It means there's less space available to absorb the outside world. This is a very a classic example of distraction. Within diving, um, think about a distraction as something that's feeding your senses and taking up brain space. It's preventing you doing what you want to do. Stewie Andrews, a, a highly credible CCR diver, I think he might have tuned in tonight. He gave me a story a while ago about distraction in diving where he was doing some filming. And in this particular situation, the camera crew were filming him disconnecting and reconnecting the loop hose onto the T piece above the counter lung and his rebreather. And on this one take where they were filming the, re the reconnection of the hose, a diver surfaced just off the side of the boat. And all the attention from the camera crew and Stewie went over to this diver and they all focused on him. They dealt with that, um, the diver surfacing unexpectedly. And a little while later, Stewie comes back to his rebreather. And by pure chance, he happened to notice that some of the threads on the T-piece were exposed and the hose hadn't actually been done up properly. He gets the hose sorted out, he goes diving, everything's fine, but he believes it's pure chance that he happened to spot the, uh, the, the partially disconnected hose. There was no robust process in place. Classic example of distraction in diving. Tenerife, 1977. This remains the worst accident in aviation history where two 747s collided on the runway at Tenerife in very bad weather and just about everybody was killed. Almost 600 people died. There was only 61 survivors, and they were from the front of the, uh, the Pan Am 747 on top. It's a KLM 747. That's right, the Pan Am aircraft on the bottom where it was chopped off. The aircraft on top is a KLM Dutch 747 where everybody died. There were multiple contributory factors to, to the all lined up to cause this accident to happen. A lot of things went wrong that day. And, and a lot of them have obviously been fixed in an effort to make sure nothing like this ever happens again. The direct cause was that the KLM captain, the captain of the blue jumbo jet on top, he took off without clearance. But why did he do that? So firstly, he was in a massive rush. It had been a really painful day. Lots of things had gone wrong. And there was a potential for lots of other things to go wrong if they couldn't get out of Tenerife. The weather, the weather was getting a lot worse and they were desperate to leave. And that makes them naturally far more inclined to cut corners to make mistakes. Also, the black box provided a lot of evidence that the Dutch captain had an extremely autocratic leadership style. He'd, albeit unwittingly, done everything he could to just piss off the first officer and the flight engineer and teamwork, crew resource management on the flight deck was effectively nil. There was just no, no, um, no teamwork at all. And what that meant was when the captain applied full power to try and take off, even if the co-pilot or the flight engineer had thought, they haven't got clearance to take off. They'd have just been less inclined to intervene because there was no real culture of, of teamwork and motivation on the flight deck. Nobody has all the answers. It is absolutely vital uh, as a team leader to do all you can to motivate your team, to encourage them, to empower them, such that they feel they can definitely speak up quickly and effectively if they see things, something go wrong, so that as a team you can work together and make sure that safety things are mitigated. Dr. 
Guy Garman died in 2015 while trying to break the open circuit deep dive record. He was trying to go to 1,200 feet or 365 meters. Now he was assessed as being competent on paper, but you have to ask if he had the sufficient experience. He had four years of diving from first dive to the time of his death. He had less than 600 dives logged in total, 200 of which were below 60 meters, 35 of which were deeper than 150 meters, and the previous dive was down to 800 feet or 243 meters. And now he wanted to go over 100 meters deeper on the record attempt. There was no consolidation here at all, really. He just went, he just kept on going deeper and deeper uh, and surviving and getting away with it and getting away with it. Just going deeper and deeper every time was becoming completely normal. And this is an example of the normalization of deviation with the diving fatality. Also, within the organization that he was using, there was a, a background culture of glorifying deep diving. You got a T-shirt if you went deeper than 300 feet. There was a lot of social media presence, a lot of people egging each other on to go deeper, and that will naturally uh, be a bit of pressure to, to force people to go um, or encourage people to go beyond their limits when perhaps they shouldn't. From what I can tell online, there was no evidence of a, of a, of a thorough investigation into the background of this accident. But you have to wonder if group thing was a factor as well. He had a big support team. There were lots of divers helping him with this whole project and the record attempt. And you just can't help wondering that maybe one or two of them thought, you know what, Doc, I'm not sure if this is actually such a good idea. Maybe we should just take it slowly. But given the culture and everybody else involved and all the, most, all the peer pressure and everything else from social media, would people have even put their hands up if they did think it was a bad idea? The good news is there are lots of things you can do to mitigate against human factors. And you already do quite a few things. Uh, muscle memory and motor programs, that's where the brain gets good at doing things and things become relatively automatic. You haven't got to put much effort into them. When you're driving down the motorway and you realize that you've forgotten what's happened for the last 10 minutes or you can't remember what's happened for the last 10 minutes, that's because your brain has got so good at driving down the motorway that it's almost working on autopilot. Your eyes and ears are still aware of what's going on and are feeding information to your brain in case things go wrong, but it, you can do it largely subconsciously. Within diving, most BCDs are designed such that the hose comes over the left shoulder, the inflate button's on the side, the deflate button is on the end, and your fingers and thumbs rapidly get used to being in the right place to achieve the effect you want. And it's not just where they need to be, but you also get, them to use, get used quite quickly to how long you have to push the buttons for, depending on what your senses are telling you and how deep you are, how shallow you are, how quickly you're going up and down to achieve the buoyancy effect that you want. And that's all part of muscle memory and motor program. Computers and rebreather handsets are designed to distract you if appropriate. If everything's fine, there'll be steady symbology, nothing changes. But as things start to go wrong, whether it be missing a deco stop or if your oxygen levels are wrong on a rebreather, <clears throat> they will change color. They will start flashing at you. They will start beeping at you deliberately to distract you grab your attention so that you look down at your computer and see what's going on so you can fix the problem. As with a lot of things, awareness is a, is a big part of all this. Just by being aware that human factors exist and having a rough idea how to get around them makes you far less likely to be susceptible to them. I'll talk about some, some models now for human factors. Professor James Reason, who's a real pioneer of, uh, of human factors research, he came up with the Swiss cheese model um, around the turn of the century. And what this model shows is that outcomes are not as the result of single points of failure. It's to do with multiple failures are coming together at the wrong time, a lot of which are in the background. And the idea is that the slices in the cheese form barriers to things going wrong, but each barrier has flaws in it, like the holes in the, in the Swiss cheese. And when those holes line up, that's when you have an unfavorable outcome. Organizational factors can include commercial pressures. In the current climate of COVID, let's say a dive company hasn't dived for a couple of months, they're now legally allowed to go diving, but the weather's a bit marginal. They are more likely to go diving in that weather just to stay in business, as opposed to if they've been diving every day for the last two months, the weather's been glorious, and now the same marginal weather day comes up, they're more likely to say no. Training courses are designed with all the best intentions, but until you have the end product, the trained divers that come out the other end and get to put those fields into practice, you may well never see the holes in the, in the course until quite far down the line. 
But those holes were in there right at the start. In terms of unsafe supervision, simple example, instructors just have bad days. And if we all have bad days, and if the instructor is for some reason not doing so well that day, they may well, excuse me, just miss something that goes through to the next layer. Preconditions, hangover, miserable weather, putting yourself under time pressure, they will all add up um, to expose you more risk of having an unfaithful outcome. And then lastly, an unsafe act itself. For example, like I talked about earlier, doing your pre-dive checks without a buddy monitoring means that the holes all line up and an unfaithful outcome occurs. This video just attempts to show that the process is actually dynamic. The regard, it's to do with the location of the dive, the conditions on the day, um, the people involved, and the holes vary in size and amount all the time. And it's only when the holes line up that the incident occurs. And the difficulty is knowing what else has happened further up the chain, and so when your hole is now relevant. So this picture shows me and my girlfriend Amanda after our first dive together with nobody else involved. And this was in uh, Australia back end of last year, and it was a we had a, we had a good time, as you can see by our smiles. It was a shore dive, relatively shallow, and quite simple. But at the end, we had an unfaithful outcome, whereas where Amanda had a uncontrolled descent. Only from six meters, nothing drastically unsafe, but certainly a bit unfavorable. So what I did was I went back and looked at the things that led up to that and put it into the Swiss cheese model. So to start with, this was our first dive together as a couple. Now I've done a lot of dive leading, I've done quite a bit of diving with Amanda, but we would never actually dived together where it was just the two of us with no other supervision, no dive company or anything like that. And that added a bit of extra pressure on both of us, I think. I did give a, a brief which included some hand signals, but I didn't, didn't cover the hand signals for cold and cramp because it was Australia in the summer, right? And you don't get cold and cramp. Turns out it was quite unseasonably cold that day and they would have been quite useful. We didn't have uh, hoods or gloves because it's Australia in the summer. You don't need them, but with hindsight, they would have been quite useful. So during the dive, the cold starts to get to Amanda um, quite a bit. And she gets cramped, but she doesn't know how to tell me because she hasn't been told, uh, or she may have been told once upon a time that she forgot, and I haven't briefed her. But she decides that she can probably carry on and finish the dive. So that's what we press for. And then when we get to the six meter safety stop, Amanda is starting to breathe a bit heavier, a bit anxious, a bit uncomfortable, and her buoyancy control goes a bit wayward. She starts to she starts to become positive and buoyant. She tries to fin back down and dump air out of her jacket using the, using the BCD hose. But the problem now. That she's almost upside down so the, the hose won't do anything to get rid of the air if she didn't know to use the kidney dumps again arguably due to lack of experience this becomes a vicious cycle and she floats to the surface she gives up quite quickly and come back down and just waits for me on the surface of an uncontrolled ascent now all these things are relatively easy fixes and it's unlikely i think that amanda and i will have an unfavorable outcome of this nature again due to any of these causes we can fix all these quite easily Something else I'll throw in which can help to uh, interpret and understand the Swiss cheese model are the concepts of latent conditions and active failures. Active failures are traditionally what we look for as the cause of an accident. In this case, poor buoyancy control, poor dump valve use, that's what caused the accident. But it's a bit more complicated than that. You've, also, you've got to go back and look at the latent condition, things that happened in the background that led up to the active failures, even, becoming, um, even, even having to become relevant as that were. It's more important than just the active failures. As mentioned earlier, the brain only has so much space. But what you can do is manage how the brain uses that space. You can put things that the brain has to do, that you have to do, into the um, motor program area, the muscle memory area, which allows it to, which frees up space and allows it to deal with extra input. This is called the capacity bucket, to do how much capacity you've got. So you can make the bucket bigger by training, practicing, and experience to start with. The more you train, the more you practice the skills that you've been trained in, and the more experience you have, which naturally means that all those things that you're doing, as the brain gets better, they go into the muscle memory side of the brain, and it frees up capacity to do other things. By planning and briefing before a dive, you can prepare yourself for uh, things that could go wrong. You can anticipate things that probably will be a bit different and therefore that will automatically put capacity you'll be less surprised when things happen and then by debriefing you can take things from that dive and use it to follow on dives so all those things 
will help make the bucket bigger. Okay, so how it fills up. First of all, kit problems. If you have a leaky mask, that is a classic example uh, of something that's going to take away the capacity. You'll be wasting time clearing the mask, it'll be just that little niggle all the time, it'll never really go away and reduce your ability to do anything. If the visibility drops down to one or two meters, you will be wasting a lot of time, or rather spending a lot of time, just focused on your body for fear of losing it, and you'll have very little capacity to do anything else. Distractions can be external, things before the dive. Let's say you've had an argument with your partner, or your car's gone in the garage, and you're expecting a big bill. Those kind of things are going to weigh on your mind. Or even during the dive, where you see an interesting bit of wildlife, or your buddy keeps wandering off and taking your attention. All those things will, will fill up your capacity bucket and reduce the ability to deal with everything. If you're a dive manager uh, or a supervisor on the surface and you're trying to organize everything, a good way for emptying your capacity bucket in that situation is by delegating tasks to other divers so that other people can leave your workload and you can look at doing other things um, if they arise, um, which is just gives you that best more capacity. So think about delegating if it's appropriate. If the bucket gets full, then nothing else can go in. You'll rapidly become quite useless, essentially. And so it really does, it really is in your best interest to do everything you can to keep your capacity bucket with some space in. I'll talk a bit about planning and briefing now. So thinking about planning, a good little mantra to use is avoid, trap, mitigate. Do what you can to avoid the conditions that cause errors in the first place. Give yourselves plenty of time to minimise the risk of time pressure. Have a plan B ready to go in case plan A gets scuffled. Use checklists to make sure that you've got your kit rather than trying to rely on memory. If people suffer from seasickness, then make sure they take the tablets before they need to. Trap errors before they occur. So have equipment spares ready to go. And if people aren't fit to dive, they aren't ready to dive, then stop them diving. Get them ready if possible and before they put themselves in an unfavorable situation. And then put errors in place to mitigate errors that do occur. So I put measures in place to mitigate errors that do occur. Make sure that you can fail safely. Have equipment redundancy. If you're going to go into a night dive or into a wreck, make sure you've taken a spare torch or two. Have a backup if your computer fails. Have a rescue plan that's solid and ready to go. Make sure you've got an up to date first aid kit and you've got enough oxygen on board. And worst case, have insurance if you're going to need it. Keep the brief brief. Clues in the title. What that means is only talk for as long as you need to. Don't spend time, don't spend extra time talking about things because you'll just lose people. If it's a group of brand new ocean divers, the brief may well need to be reasonably thorough, cover lots of points to make sure you cover all the bases. But if you're diving with a buddy who you dive with all the time, you know each other very well, then actually you can cut that brief down markedly and just highlight the differences. One thing that is pretty important, though, I think, in any brief is to make sure that the rest of the team are consciously aware that if they see something they aren't sure about, to speak up, to highlight it, highlight it, um, because you as the dive, the dive leader, cannot see everything. And it's really important that people um, don't assume that you've seen it, because it's, it's all to do with preventing those holding the tubes lining up. Direct error management is a technique it's widely used in commercial aviation today. And think of this as kind of like a, a dynamic risk assessment where it's where you'd look at specific uh, likely scenarios, likely situations, and focus your attention on those so you can mitigate them. If you know you're diving into bad vis or into a wreck or into some kind of current, those are things you would focus on to make sure uh, to make sure that you can that you've got measures in place to deal with them. Ask open questions in a brief. An open question is a question that requires more than a yes or no answer. For example, you would say to your one of your divers, give me the hand signal that you've got 150 bar, or tell me what you're going to do if you lose your buddy. It keeps people engaged, it keeps their, it keeps their minds moving, and it proves they're listening as well. The briefing technique. Moving on to debriefing. The reason we debrief is to look at outcomes, whether they be good or bad, and then identify causes of those outcomes such that we can learn from them. And it's important that everybody learns. That's the whole idea of it in the debrief, not just the individual um, concern. And if you talk about them, you're much more likely to accurately identify what happens rather than just trying to do it internally. 
You can do it straight away. Uh, if you're going diving again, and something needs fixing just after the surface interval and you might do it straight away. But it's often a good idea to do it at the end of the diving session, whether that be of an evening or after the dive before everybody goes home, just to make sure that all those lessons are, are dealt with and, and then everybody can go on from there. If you leave it any longer than that, then things will just get missed. It's important to debrief the bad points and look at the fixes for those, but it's also really important to debrief the good points and look at why good outcomes occurred so that you can reinforce good behaviour. Look for individuals to come up with a bad point and a good point. Look for a, uh, good, a bad point and a good point for the whole team and try and finish on a good point because it leaves the whole thing in a positive frame in front of mind. Try not to waffle. As with the brief, if you waste time talking about things that don't need to be talked about, you'll just lose people. And then the, when they're having a micro nap, they will miss key details. Chronological order is sensible. It keeps people um, uh, up to date as it were, and they're less likely to, get, to, to miss things. And as the debriefer, make sure that you admit your own mistakes, because that goes a long way to encouraging other people to speak up. Mark mentioned checklists at the start. This is a huge subject all of its own. I'll just come up with a few things now which can, which can help uh, with human factors. The big thing is you have to want to use a checklist and it has to be appropriate for the situation. It's all about, as with the definition, it has to make it easier to do the right thing. If it's not doing that, it's really a hindrance or a nuisance. It's just, it's just useless. There's no point in having a, uh, a written checklist with ink if you're on a dive boat for a pre-dive check it's just going to get ruined it's going to get wet and ruined you've got to use the check and um, uh, checklist appropriate for the situation now written checklists do have a place i've got a checklist on my uh, on my iphone and it's just a simple way of before i leave the house i just make sure i've got all my got all my stuff before i actually go another example for written checklists would be um a rebreather assembly just to make sure you don't miss any steps obviously if you're doing checks as a team, it is absolutely vital that they're standardized. And what I mean by standardized is that everybody uses the check, everybody's familiar with it. And it just means that when diver A is monitoring diver B, they know what the checks are doing, they know what's coming up next, and they're much more likely to pick up errors um, in diver B's checks. Memorized checks definitely have a place, especially in recreational diving, I think, where, where things tend to be a little bit simpler. And the best example that we've got is bar. Our, pre-dive body checks. It's a short word, it's an English word, it's easy to have in our brain, it's got a few simple steps and the best thing is it's standardized so it doesn't matter who else your buddy is, as long as they're from BSAC they will be familiar with the bar check and it makes it much easier for you to monitor them and pick up any small errors that creep in when they're doing their checks, all to do with stopping those holes in the cheese line. Challenge and response checks. What this, this is again widely used in aviation, the idea being that the challenger issues a challenge to the diver, the diver then responds with the appropriate response and then move on to the next step. It's very good at uh, mitigating against distraction and making sure nothing, again, nothing is missed. As an example, in the rebreather world, uh, the dive manager would go up to the rebreather diver before they're about to get in the water and say, okay, show me your unit is switched on, unit is switched on, show me your oxygen is switched on, oxygen on, show me your diluents on, diluents on, and show me your direct uh, feed if the suit works. If that works brilliant tick ready to go it's it's quick it will rapidly become very familiar people will know what to expect and like i say it really does work wonders mitigating against distraction things all to do with stopping those holes in the cheese line if you do want to use a written checklist just some thoughts for that if you want to design one yourself this is a a good example of a written checklist don't worry about the actual content of it i'm just going to talk about how it's designed First of all, it's interesting to look at. It's got a little picture at the top. It's got different fonts, different size fonts, different style of fonts, and lots of color. It's, a, it's an interesting checklist to look at. It's going to make you more likely to use it. It's got bullet points. They're not very wordy, but all the bullet points are sufficient so that you know what you're doing. It's broken into sections, which makes it much easier to do a section, keep track of where you are. If you get distracted, it's easier to find where you were before. And again, just makes it easier to use. And it uses color, which helps to make it interesting, but you can also use color, highlight things in red, use red font, which can draw your eye to the appropriate safety critical points. Conversely, this is a bad example of a checklist. Again, don't worry about the content, but there's far too many points here, far too many words with a lot of the points. 
not broken into sections at all, very easy to get forward and lose your way, and there's no use of colour. This is a, a bad example. So let's talk about a just safety culture. The idea of a just culture is to identify what went wrong, <coughs> excuse me, not who caused the problem. It's trying to find the root causes of unfavorable outcomes. People will um, report near misses, report things that went wrong or almost went wrong, such that trends can be identified and fixes can be put in place such that you don't have one unfavorable outcome too many that results in an accident, an incident, or worse still, a fatality. It obviously relies very heavily on honesty and openness. People have to be able to admit errors and mistakes without fear of retribution. We call this, or it, rather it's called psychological safety, where people can put their hands up and not worry about the potential outcomes, not worry about being ostracized or, or bullied or victimized or anything like that. It's really, really, really important. Something to highlight with the just culture is it's not a no blame culture. If somebody blatantly violates the rules for personal gain, then they can expect to be punished in accordance with, with the rules that they've set themselves. You cannot punish honest mistakes, though. If people do things wrong, but honestly, they're trying to do the right thing, then you just need to learn from that. As soon as you punish an honest mistake, you will lose that person and it's game over. Um, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody talks about their errors, um, their, their errors, their mistakes, and then everybody keeps learning. One thing as well to think about with just culture, the word culture tends to get people thinking about big groups of people, whether it be staff or, or the whole diving world, but actually it can go all the way down to just a diving a couple, a husband and wife team, if they're diving together, regardless whether it's just a pair, a BSAC branch, or the entirety of, of BSAC. It's all to do with, um, within that whole team, just being able to you know, psychologically save such that you can talk about your errors and everybody can learn safety can be. If anybody wants to do any further reading, then as Mark mentioned at the start, Gareth Locke runs his website, thehumandiver.com, and he's probably forgotten more about human factors in diving than I'll ever know. This video here, uh, if only, it's on Vimeo. Take a um, photo of that screenshot if you like to, to watch. It's really, really interesting. It's about 25 minutes long, and uh, Gareth went to Hawaii to make this make this documentary with Brian's widow. I'm sorry, I just heard a bit more, bit more background. The documentary is about a chap called Brian who died um, while doing some rebreather training in Hawaii a couple of years ago. And Gareth went to Hawaii, he spoke to Brian's widow, he spoke to the other members of the dive team, and came up with this this documentary looking at the human factors. And it's absolutely fascinating. He he found things that were almost ultimately human factor failings that went right back to uh, Brian's first ever dive, um, which ultimately all added up to culminate in tragedy. It's like really interesting video. Google and YouTube have got a plethora of information on this subject. You can um, look through all sorts of quite simple short videos, all the way through to some quite serious long winded articles, lots of information on them. As I said at the start, I will finish with three big takeaways for human factors that you can take forward to start with. Briefing and debriefing. Briefing is, is a key factor for safety. It's, it's a huge part of increasing the size of the capacity bucket. It's important though that the brief is the appropriate length, depending on who you're talking to. Make sure you only cover the relevant points. Don't talk about anything you don't need to. And ask open questions so that it keeps the audience engaged and motivated. Like I mentioned on the briefing slide, make sure though that everybody is aware that they've got a speaking to And if they see something they're not happy with, highlight it because you as the dive leader, you cannot see everything. It's all to do with enhancing that group situation awareness. Debriefing is instrumental in allowing lessons to be learned for everybody, not just the person concerned. Look at bad points that you can fix, but also look at good points and good behaviors such that you can reinforce that and do it again. As the debriefer, make sure you admit your own errors and that will encourage other people to speak up, help create that culture of psychological safety. Keep an open mind. You you don't know what you don't know. Nobody has all the answers, and I ask you to be open to new ideas and keep learning. I am always learning, regardless of what I'm doing. Others may have the answer you need, um, or they may just have had similar experiences, which just help your thinking and help you get the answer you want. Now, diving is pretty safe. It's statistically very safe, 
and the kit is very reliable as we know so as long as you use the kit properly with appropriate redundancy in place that just leaves the human factor to go wrong human factors awareness it will not definitely stop you or your buddy having an accident but it just might and i think that it's really important that we as divers look at the human factor take it into account to do what we can to make diving as safe as we can